Good just afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Reeves. I'm a professor of political mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. and the director of the Wiedenbaum Center on the Economy, Government, and Public Policy. It's a great honor to welcome you all today to our uh, first event of the academic year, uh, appropriately titled A Warm Welcome, Immigration, Inclusion in Divisive Times. Uh, today's event marks the beginning of an exciting and critical series of events, of events at the Wiedenbaum Center. Um, first and foremost, I especially wanna thank uh, our associate director, Professor Ariella Schachter, um, who spearheaded uh, the exciting event that we have today. Um, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, the Wiedenbaum Center uh, is a research institute. We are dedicated to uh, supporting social scientific research in the fields of public policy, political science, economics, and sociology. Uh, our mission is to bridge the gap between scholars uh, researchers and policymakers, and the broader community by fostering what we, we really need these days, which is uh, informed public dialogue on the pressing issues of our time. Uh, as we look ahead to the upcoming election in November, the role of unbiased empirical research and informed discourse cannot, of course, be overstated. The Wiedenbaum Center is proud to be a nonpartisan research institute committed to providing a platform for rigorous analysis and thoughtful conversation on the complex challenges that face our nation and our world. Uh, just briefly, uh, this fall we have a great lineup of events, of events that we believe will do what I just <laughs> said, will educate and engage uh, especially uh, today's event on, uh, Im uh, on immigration. We're also thrilled to host uh, just on Monday, Sean Trendy, uh, an elections analysis from Real Clear Politics. Uh, then on Thursday, we're hosting a breakfast with a uh, former president of the St. Louis Fed and current Dean of uh, Purdue Business School, uh, Dr. Jim Ballard. Uh, I also have to mention that we partly support our mission with a group of dedicated supporters, and we put on lots of great events uh, for that group. So if you're interested in joining us, uh, you can visit us on our website at wc.wusel.edu, uh, or you can speak with Elizabeth Larson, our Associate Director of Research and Administration, and you can pick up a handout with all of our, our great events that are upcoming. So I encourage you to, to do that. Um, now, I would like to introduce uh, Ariella, and we'll get started with this uh, fantastic program. Uh, professor Ariella Schachter is Associate Professor of Sociology uh, and Associate Director of the Wiedenbaum Center, also Associate Chair. Oh, that sounds exhausting. Um, her research, oh my gosh, her research is so amazing. Uh, she explores pressing issues related to immigration, race, ethnicity, group relations, and inequality in the United States. Uh, she's currently engaged in this really exciting interdisciplinary team. Um, they're developing a web-based app that facilitates dialogue between immigrants and non-immigrants in St. Louis and across the country. Uh, you know, hopefully all of you get like the, the record, the work of research that's being done here at WashU. If you ever see her name mentioned, be sure to, to look and read uh, what she's up to because she's doing some really phenomenal research. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Ariella. Thank you, Andrew, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all so much for joining us here today. When I first approached Andrew about holding an event like this in the runoff to the presidential election, it was because I suspected that immigration would be a key issue during the campaign. But I certainly did not predict that one of the major candidates running for president would insist on national television that immigrants are eating people's pets. But here we are. Um, and so I'm extremely grateful to be able to introduce our experts um, that we've gathered with us today so we can have a real fact-based conversation about how communities like ours in St. Louis, as well as across the country, can be welcoming and inclusive spaces even in the present political climate, and indeed um, why inclusion at the local level often is a bipartisan uh, issue. 
So in just a moment, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists. But first, just a few words about how our time together is gonna be structured today. Um, I've asked our panelists to think of this as a conversation that we're having with one another and with all of you. Um, so we'll start with some questions that I've prepared, but we plan to leave ample time for your questions. And you can see there's microphones at either end um, on either side. And when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll ask you to come up to the microphone to ask your questions so that all of us can hear you. Um, we'll get to as many questions as time allows. And if we aren't able to get to your question before we need to wrap up, um, I ask that you please come and introduce yourself to our panelists during the reception that will immediately follow so we can continue the conversation together. Um, now it's my honor to introduce our panelists. Um, so I'm just gonna go in the order that everyone is seated here today, starting with Katie Herbert Meyer, who's a professor of practice and director of the Immigration Law Clinic here at WashU. Before joining the faculty at WashU, she spent 15 years practicing immigration law, primarily in the nonprofit sector. And more recently, she served as the program coordinator and supervising attorney at the Migrant Immigrant Community Action Project in St. Louis, or the MICA Project. She previously served as the legal director at Interfaith Legal Services for Immigrants, and also worked as an immigration attorney at the Bleich Law Firm and at Legal Services of Eastern Missouri. She's an active member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association and serves on its National Asylum and Refugee Committee. Her areas of expertise include family-based immigration, refugee and asylum law, naturalization law, removal defense, which is deportation defense, and legal protections for immigrant victims. Uh, she presents numerous trainings on various aspects of immigration, refugee law, and policy, and has served as an immigration expert on discussion panels and in media interviews. She's a graduate of our own WashU School of Law, and the hat, where she received awards for her dedication to public service and public interest law. Thanks for joining us, Katie. Um, okay, next up we have Dina Okamoto, who is the class of 1948 Herman B. Wells professor in the Department of Sociology at Indiana University. She recently, I think, happily finished serving as the co-editor of American Sociological Review, which is the flagship journal of the American Sociological Association, and was also previously the director of the Center for Research on Race and Ethnicity in Society at Indiana University. Her current projects in, um, investigate the civic and political incorporation of immigrants and the formation of new racial categories and identities such as Asian American and how organizations deal with increasing ethnic, racial, and language diversity. She's currently completing a book on how ethno-racial diversity and intergroup contact shape immigrants' integration into the U.S. context and the shared early versions of this work with Welcoming America, a national nonprofit that helps hundreds of communities across the nation to develop and implement policies and practices that effectively include immigrants and create an environment where everyone can thrive. Thank you for joining us today, Dina. Next, we have Valerie Plesch, who's an independent first-generation American Vietnamese Argentinian photojournalist, documentary photographer, and writer based in Washington, D.C., where she covers politics, Capitol Hill, immigration, refugee resettlement, and other issues for editorial assignments. Her long-term work explores the intersection of the aftermath of wars, memory, identity, and trauma. In 2022, she was awarded a Pulitzer Center reporting grant to cover the one-year anniversary of the fall of Kabul through stories about Afghans who had evacuated to the United States. And from 2014 to 2019, she was based in Pristina, Kosovo, and also reported from Afghanistan during the 2014 historic presidential election and produced other feature stories. Uh, before pursuing her passion for visual storytelling, Valerie held a decade-long career in the international development field, implementing U.S. aid-funded projects, and she holds a master's degree in journalism from the Columbia University School of Journalism and a bachelor's degree in political science from Colorado College. Thanks for being here, Valerie. Last but certainly not least, we have our St. Louis's own Gilberto, Gilberto Pinella, who's the inaugural director of the Office of New Americans under the mayor, um, Tashara Jones. Uh, Gilberto was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and is a U.S. Air Force veteran. Since he arrived in St. Louis in 1991, his mission has been to serve as a changemaker, advocate, and ambassador of the Latine and LGBTQIA plus communities. His professional journey as an entrepreneur, communications, and now public servant includes co-owning the Greenery Plant Company, producing and hosting the first Spanish-language television show in Missouri, Ora San Luis and Perante, and helping creating the Communications and Public Relations Department for the Cortex Innovation District. His work in advocacy includes serving on the, bo the boards of PROMO, the Latinx Committee for the Missouri Historical Society, and many others. Gilberto earned his MBA and MA in communications at Webster University and is pursuing an MBA from the same institution. So very busy right now. <laughs> a little. <laughs> Just a little. Um, great. Thank you all so much for being here. I thought we might start with a, a simple, a deceptively simple initial question, which is just, what do we mean when we're talking about immigrant inclusion? So what does it mean to you? Um, and maybe I'll, I'll let uh, 
Uh, Gilbert, did you want to start? Oh, do I? <laughs> I start. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you. When I started this, I think it's yeah, it's past noon. So when I started this, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today and uh, share a little bit of what we're doing through the Office of New Americans uh, in the city. So uh, what those immigrant inclusion means to me personally, as the director of the Office of New Americans for Mayor Tichara Jones, I will say making St. Louis a place where every immigrant, every newcomer, every, whether you're a refugee, whether you are an asylum seeker or somebody coming here just as a secondary migration, uh, coming to school and so forth, making St. Louis a place where you belong. That not only it attracts you, but it also retains you. Uh, we wanna make St. Louis safer, stronger and healthier for our foreign born communities. And, and that is what immigrant inclusion will mean to me in this capacity of director of Office of New Americans. Um, so for me, di uh, immigrant um, inclusion means diversity in institutions and in neighborhoods, cities. Um, I grew up in the Vietnamese American immigrant community. So I, I, I know how that is to live in a community that thrives because of the immigrants. So um, yeah, seeing more diversity in po local politics, in, the, in schools, and um, just seeing immigrants thrive, I think that's a big marker of, of inclusion. Um, again, thanks for inviting me to be here. It's very exciting to sit on a panel with these esteemed folks. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, and what, how I think about immigrant inclusion is similar, I think, to what folks have already said. And I guess I think about um, immigrants being treated as, as full citizens um, under the law, um, afforded the same opportunities within institutions, such as education, labor force, um, healthcare, but also being treated as full citizens in everyday interactions, um, being treated with dignity, value and care. Um, and I like this word thrive, right? So an environment where immigrants can thrive um, and take advantage of these opportunities, they have access to resources. Um, and I think one of the things I hope that we'll get into talking about today, I, th I think a lot about how um, inclusionary policies, but also practices and getting those two things to align. I'll echo the thank you for including me in this. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I know I'm going to learn a lot from um, from everyone else on the panel. Um, I kind of did a very, I guess, lawyerly thing to do, and I started off as like, well, I'm going to go look up what what does inclusion mean, right? So I think a typical definition of inclusion is is sort of thought of as what I'm going to call like a two way street, right? So there's considerations of whether new arrivals into a community are sort of fitting the mold of what community existing community members expect them to do, right? So we look to this data and are, are they learning our language? Are, you know, are they obtaining jobs? Um, are they contributing financially, right? But then on the other side, we're supposed to also, as part of this theoretical definition, be asking these questions that I think we really are wanting to focus on today, which is, but what are the feelings of belonging experienced by those immigrants, right? And again, I also really like that word thrive, right? I think we've done a good job, all the data I can find. I think we do a, a good job or we focus too much on that side of our, um, you know, American citizens or, or the those who were in America first, are, are they experiencing newcomers as fitting in? I think we have areas to grow and, and can continue to work on those areas of really trying to find out what we can better do so that immigrants themselves feel they belong, right? So I think, you know, some of these same ideas of um, what access do they have to civic institutions, right? I mean, it's great that the mayor's office has an office looking at this now, but we'll talk about this. I have a feeling being in Missouri, but access to simple things that we take for granted, like driver's licenses, right? Um, ability to get kids in school without undue burdens and hurdles and access to housing, um, you know, jobs without exploitation. I think, you know, these are some of the things I think of when I think about um, 
immigrant inclusion. Um, and, and yeah, again, some of this is, is coming from my experience of working with immigrants living in Missouri, which I guess we can talk more, but it has a long ways to go in, in really being a place I think that is in, inclusive for immigrants. Thanks. That's, um, I saw, Gilbert, I saw you like nodding as Katie was speaking and it made me wonder, are there like particular metrics that your office is tracking when you're thinking about like, how do we measure our mission and how do we measure progress? Uh, we're, I'm 10 months into this job. So I'm establishing the foundation for, for what the future will look like. I'm not yet establishing formal met metrics on, but working with community organizations such as MICA, uh, the International Institute, and other organizations that are working in the space directly with the new American communities to make sure that we are a partner at the table and then figure out what those metrics should be as we move St. Louis into a city that that makes, a, you know, that helps everybody feel that they belong. Dina, from your research, is there like a set of metrics that you tend to think of? Yeah, so some of the work that I do is in, um, so I've done some work in Atlanta, Philadelphia, parts of San Francisco, to try to get a sense of um, like feelings of belonging, feelings of, um, do you feel welcome? Mm -hmm. um, also, do you feel accepted? Do you feel deserving? Um, and as a sociologist, I think most of the survey measures are really more about, do you feel threatened? Um, and we wanted to think about kind of more positive measures that would think about inclusion. And we also wanted to think about measures that weren't about like how tied you are to non-immigrants. Are you friends with non-immigrants? Though we do have some of that data, but we wanted to just to get at these kind of the social psychological feelings about include what we think would capture inclusion. Um, and we also have data on um, the non-immigrant side from folks and we ask them um, to what extent are you willing to reach out to others? To what extent are you willing, willing to welcome others? Do you have an interest in getting to know people who are different from you? Trying to get again, both sides of this process, not just immigrants and what they can do to be included or how they can fit in, but what non-immigrants can do to make immigrants feel mm -hmm. like they're included. Um, so those are the kinds of measures that, that we've thought about, but also we have measures of um, local ordinances and policies, right? Access to ID, state issued IDs, and driver's licenses, um, in state tuition for um, undocumented immigrants, um, I'm trying to think of other things, sanctuary laws. Um, so again, we're trying to get at two different levels to measure but I think there's nothing like going into a hospital or to a school or talking to immigrants or following immigrants and getting their experiences about what is it like this process of getting your kids in K through 12? What is it like for your kids to be in that space? So I think there are all different ways that we can better understand these immigrant experiences of inclusion. I, I just wanted to add that, you know, in, the, in, the, in this early work, uh, establishing the office um, and working with community organizations. For example, I can tell you it's not a formal metric, but it's, it's a way that I know that people are engaged and our new communities are engaged. Um, we have inclement weather. And if you come into San Luis from an area that you experience conflict and you hear a siren, you, you may either run or hide because you think that you're being attacked, right? So, um, I work with SEMA, which is our city emergency management agency, to make sure that we inform our foreign-born communities in different languages that there is an application that you can download called Notify SDL. And we did PSAs in Spanish, Bosnian, Hindi, Swahili, Vietnamese, and, um, and English, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Anyways. So... The engagement on the, the PSAs that led to downloads, for example, the Spanish one attracted over 11,000 impressions in like the first month that the PSA was out there. Very important for our foreign born community to know that if you hear a siren go off in the city of St. Louis, that 
it it's not because you're we're being attacked it is because there may be a tornado and you have to uh, run to your bas basement so it is an early way to measure what we're doing and the response from people that are moving here that are beginning to uh, experience what we experience here in the city of St. Louis as far as weather is concerned. I've been asked to encourage all of us to lean into our microphones when we're speaking or pull them forward because apparently they're not picking us up. Um, I'm wondering from all of that, I think we like these these answers are hinting at some of the challenges, some of the solutions, but also some of the challenges that communities, including St. Louis, face when it comes to welcoming immigrants. I was wondering, maybe Katie, do you want to start off from like a, a legal perspective? What are some of the key challenges that you see when it comes to inclusion? And and you're asking key challenges locally in the St. Louis area, in particular, but like particular? yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. I, I mean. I guess short answer, we face the challenges we face are because St. Louis falls under Missouri state law and Missouri state law has not only has the Missouri state legislature made decisions not to create more welcoming <laughs> rules. They've actually made very conscious decisions to pass laws to discourage immigrants mm -hmm. from living here or make their lives much more difficult. And while their stated intention may be that they want to, you know, make the lives of undocumented immigrants more difficult, and, and I'm not saying I agree with that as, as, as a policy goal, I don't, but the actual impact goes far beyond that and, and impacts, you know, all, all immigrants and, and children of immigrants too, U.S. born children of immigrants. So again, for example, the really big one, uh, Missouri uh, very consciously does not allow um, many categories of immigrants to obtain driver's license in the United States. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not just, oh, if you're here without status, you can't get a driver's license, right? That, that is a category that, that is excluded. And that does lead to, uh, safety issues on our roads, but we also exclude many categories of immigrants who are here lawfully, but temporarily we reserve driver's license for people who have lawful permanent or well-established on the way to permanent immigration status. Um, and I think you all know how often we pull out our driver's license, right? I mean, it's a gateway to almost everything, right? Um, if you have, have kids and you go to enroll your kids in school, the first thing they're gonna say is when you give me your ID, right? Um, you go to, how many of you go to doctor's offices and they say, I need your, I need your driver's license and your insurance card? right? It is just such a necessary tool. Um, additionally, um, again, those same category of immigrants in Missouri then um, are not eligible for social security numbers, right? Um, that's not Missouri's fault, but the combination of, of this lack of, of identity is really difficult. Um, and, it, and it leads immigrants to, to not only feel they don't belong, which is Im critically important to measure, um, but it also just leads to a lot of um, uh, escalating consequences, right? Um, if you have no choice, but you know you, the job that you were able to get requires you to drive and you're driving without the license and you get tickets, right? It just becomes an esca an escalating problem. Um, and so you know, and it and it leads to people not only feeling they they don't belong, but actually not be not being able to participate in, mm -hmm. in you know civil society. So I, you know, I think that's a, a real hurdle we have here. Um, I, additionally, um, I, you know, I'll just say it, there's a big lack of funding for the needed immigrant services, right? Again, some states, um, we have Illinois on our border that, that has made um, intentional decisions to, to do things quite differently, right? And the state of Illinois offers funding in, for certain uh, types of immigration legal services. Um, and so funding is, is quite difficult in St. Louis for legal service providers, for social service providers. And because of that, our capacity to work with immigrants is more limited than we would like to. So to me, I think those are the big buckets, right? Laws and then funding. Um, and, and you know, we can talk further about sort of how that plays out on a micro level. Thank you. Valerie, I was wondering if you wanted to kind of jump in with uh, like the outside of St. Louis perspective from your work. Yeah, um, through my reporting, I've done a lot of stories, especially in the last three years on Afghan refugee resettlement, because in the Washington, D.C. area, we've seen tens of thousands of Afghans, well, yeah, resettle um, in that area. But from what I've seen, there's been 
a real big strain on local organizations to resettle, um, uh, especially the Afghans who ha who came after the fall of Kabul. There were just so many, so many people fell through the cracks, and um, they were just overburdened, and um, that was very difficult to see from families who are just you know trying to restart their lives and uh, just caseworkers were neglecting them. They weren't following up on, you know, doctor's visits, getting driver's licenses, like applying for, you know, very critical documents. So I've seen that a strain on um, on these organizations that have been tasked um, are getting money from the government to help with the resettlement. Um, I've also seen uh, the need for mental health for, especially for refugees who who fled conflict, war, um, there's been a, a lack in, uh, in, in that area and, um, and especially having counselors who can speak the languages of the refugees in schools or in, you know, in, in communities. So, um, I, those are two big things that I've, I've seen lacking. It sounds like, uh, resources for language and accessibility is like a common theme. Gilberto, how is this like St. Louis as a city is just choosing to spend its money that way? Is there any support from the state or how is that working? Uh, as a, we don't have the support from the state, to be frank. Um, and as a matter of fact, every move that I make, I have to make it in a way that it's not um, bringing the attorney general against the city of St. Louis um, because they, they even threaten the city of Kansas City with legal action just because the mayor said that he will want to work welcome work authorized immigrants that are resettling to help with the need of the, the employment of the, the workforce to help companies with that so there's not there's not such a thing as help from the state which you know i envy illinois and colorado for that matter but um, you know when it, when you talk about the challenge, um, that as I see it, as we see it from the city standpoint, I know housing is a big challenge, um, especially with the Afghan resettlement, and you have large families. That that is a major challenge um, for us to to deal with. We have a lot of great market rate housing up there, and we keep building, but affordable housing for. Uh, refugees that are resettling, it is a very difficult proposition. So uh, one of the things that we're contemplating now is how can we change the law? That's in the books. In compliance with state law and following guidance from other cities like New York, Chicago, Denver, um, on how they do occupancy permits for families that are more than five people. That's one of the things that we're working on. Also, um, as I meet with different, I just had a meeting with, started a series of meetings with international students. Um, it started with Webster University also because, you know, Webster, my arm will matter. But anyways, <laughs> um, but I'm coming to you. I'm coming to Washington University as well. Um, but we, we met to gauge their sentiment about not only staying here in St. Louis uh, as students, but then planning on staying here past being a student. What will attract them? And the perception of crime is one thing that it's uh, big in their mind. And understanding that they don't see St. Louis City as just like you and I see it. They have no boundaries between whether it's Maplewood, Shrewsbury or whatever. It is all St. Louis City for them. So, so, so something can happen to them, to an uh, international student in Shrewsbury, and they think if where they talk internationally to their parents or somebody, it is all St. Louis. So we all suffer. And it's not just the city suffering here. So uh, the, the reality is that crime in St. Louis is down. Violent crime is down 45%. Uh, it keeps going down. We we are in track to see the lowest uh, violent crime uh, statistic in, from, um, in recent times since 2014 uh, here in the city of St. Louis. So we're working aggressively. I'm, I'm working with 
the Office of Violence Prevention to make sure that information that we put out there to make communities safe, uh, safer and prevent uh, crime, that is also offering different languages as well. So within the, my job is within the government, it's changing the culture of how we do business with, with, with our, our residents and changing language as simple as if I have a board and commission and I have a very, very capable residency of foreign born individuals that may be here seeking their legal status through naturalization. And they have been in San Luis for 10 years and they could be a very talented, capable individual to be on a board and commission. We have an ordinance that says that you have to be a resident, a citizen. So what does that mean? Do I have to wait till you are naturalized and become citizen? Or can we look at ways that we can allow individuals that are very talented and capable to feel that they belong by maybe changing the ordinance? It's a long-term plan, but we are pushing to make changes so everybody feel that they belong. Thank you for that. Dina, I'm wondering if you can give us like a bigger picture picture perspective, like peeling back out of St. Louis. One of the things that struck me thinking about, okay, if one of the challenges in St. Louis is the lack of affordable housing, and we are actually in a relatively affordable metro compared to other really large cities that also, also have large immigrant populations. So I would imagine that's an even greater challenge other places. Maybe you can speak to that or, or other comparisons. Yeah, I mean, definitely right in San Francisco. <laughs> Um, you know, the folks that um, I was studying mostly kind of Mexican and Southeast Asian um, refugees and immigrants. And yeah, housing affordability was a huge thing. Um, and I think one of the things I learned from my field work in that location in particular, and I studied immigrant organizations mm -hmm. that were helping people to access affordable housing, um, but also those organizations were teaching folks what their rights were mm -hmm. as tenants, um, what their rights were on their jobs, and what their rights were in schools where their children went to school, which are really basic things, but are really important, right, for navigating these local institutions. And over time, we followed, um, they're mostly um, Vietnamese and Latina mothers, who over time were Many of them were undocumented, um, the Mexican mothers, really fearful, right, of engaging with, with institutions. And over time, as they began to learn their rights and to get knowledge from the organization, that they became really empowered mm -hmm. and felt like they could navigate these institutions and really follow up on, um, again, they're undocumented, right? They're, they're in a precarious position but they're able to still make claims to these institutions and gain what they needed for their families. Um, so I'm sorry, I kind of went off in terms of the affordable housing issue, um, but I wanted to kind of come back to this issue of organizations mm -hmm. because I think they're so important for helping, and they're immigrant run organizations with immigrant staff who often come from the same backgrounds. So they don't always match in terms of national origin, but they have this immigrant background. They have a language capacity, um, but they're so important, I think, as a bridge between kind of immigrant communities, organizations, and then perhaps offices like yours, mm -hmm. um, and to policymakers to really understand what do these immigrants need? How can we get access to them? and to provide information and knowledge that they can use so they can be empowered. And I think it's all of these things at work. I think that's what makes it so complicated, this idea about inclusion, right? It's like bottom up, top down, like all these processes have to work um, for there to be affordable housing, right? These organizations push, you know, local governments for affordable housing um, and they engage in campaigns. They include immigrants in those campaigns. Um, and I think San Francisco has made some strides, but you know it's difficult, just like everywhere else. So maybe if we can engage in the thought experiment of if we didn't face the like challenges in terms of financial resources, political will, 
state level politics. I'm curious what each of you would say, like here is the ideal of what we should be doing to promote inclusion at a at the local level. I don't know if anyone wants is like jumping at the thing to go first. <laughs> no? Okay, I jumped. <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> Wow, if we had no restrictions, mm. <laughs> so many things. Um, I can, you know what, I'll start by saying uh, Denver, which Denver faced a, a crisis because where they were being, um, and Chicago as well, because uh, Greta Abbott in Texas was sending buses, which could be considered trafficking, but we're gonna leave it at that. Um, to those cities, and they were overwhelmed at the beginning. Denver um, was able to put money into because of the the state being being um, welcoming to migrants. They were they were putting they put funding into developing a Denver asylum program, and out of that program, there's a there is a program that. I kind of like, I look at and I say, that is something that maybe we can work on here in St. Louis within all the restrictions that we have available. And it's called Work Ready Denver. Now this program takes the work authorized individual or the person who is awaiting work authorization. While they await work authorization, they put them through a training. And they give them, they, they put them through English classes. They even work with a organization called Centro de los Trabajadores to um, give them ethics in how to work in an American system uh, of labor. So, you know, if you come from a country that you wake up at nine o'clock in the morning and you don't start your day till 10 because that's the way it is. Well, here you have to, you have to clock in 10 minutes before nine o'clock, right? So simple things as that. Uh, this is Centro de Trabajadores. Denver in that particular program spent $2.2 million. You know how much money they expect to create in wages alone in the first year, which will be 2026, over $14 million in revenue. Okay, on wages alone, which means that the tax base for the people that are now living in Denver will they will be able to contribute to make the economy of Denver more resilient and better. Right now, you know, as you know, we seen at the debate the situation in Springfield, Ohio, with a but they have over 10,000 people that relocated. We have a population loss that it's not just in the city of St. Louis. It is happening all over the state of Missouri. Imagine if we had the opportunity working with the state government to find practical and solutions that can help resettlement of immigrants and refugees easier thinking in the future because within the next 10 20 years 10 to 20 years we will be in serious problems because let's face it missouri is not making babies and it is a true fact look at dr Ness sandoval from st louis university the demographic study we're not losing population just in the city of St. Louis. Everybody thinks like, oh my gosh, downtown looks like so bad. It is not just happening in St. Louis, it's happening everywhere in the state of Missouri. We just don't see it yet. So if we don't do corrective actions and look at the models of cities like Chicago, Denver, Chicago in their public school system now have over 20,000 immigrants in their school system. Of course, there's pains, there's, there's, there's trials and tribulations and they have to uh, work through the system. But that will, mean that, in the, that will mean that in the future, they will be in much better place than what we are here in Missouri. 
because their population will continue to grow. And you have, and, and another thing that I say is that if the politicians that are in Jefferson City that are only throwing red meat to their base, which is dying, would think about the future of the state of Missouri and thinking how much contribution all these immigrants that are that are, that are out there that are looking for a better chance of living, whether you are an Afghan refugee or an Haitian immigrant fleeing the dictatorship and the chaos that is in Haiti right now, right? And imagine if they they are giving a chance, like working with organizations like MICA and the International Institute and San Francisco Community Services, they're giving the chance to come here and establish themselves. They are running with that chance. They're not here to take your money. They're not here to take advantage of the system. So if we lived in an ideal world, I will be talking to Crystal Quay, the next governor of Missouri. I'm sorry, I said that politically. I shouldn't have said that. I apologize. This is an unpartisan place. Um, and say, how can we work together to have the state of Missouri be a beacon of light for people that are looking for a second chance of life? I thought Katie and I, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, I agree with all of that. Again, I think, you know, if we're talking ideal world and no funding restrictions, I think we absolutely have to implement a universal representation system, right? Um, I, I, many may not know, um, there is no right to an attorney, even people facing deportation proceedings, even children, children as young as three, four years old are in removal proceedings on their own, do not get a lawyer, right? Um, and it is an extremely complicated system. You know, uh, you, we hear a lot of people say, you know, why don't people just get in line or apply? Well, the biggest reason is for most people who are undocumented, there is no line to get into. There is no form to file. But for some, there may be, but it is not a straightforward, clear path. You need to talk to lawyers to know what you might be eligible for, what hurdles there might be, what evidence you need. Um, just even figure out what form there might be for you to fill out. Then the forms are in English and they've all gotten longer over the years. Kind of a simple form to apply for permanent residence is 18 pages in English, yeah. right? So universal representation, I think is what we need, right? If we expect people to come into our country to integrate, they need to have access to important resources. And I believe that includes legal resources, right? I also think, every, I mean, everything Hilberto said, right? Just access to, to education, as, as Dina was saying too, right? To, to, to know your rights presentations, to education. Um, but also I, I do wanna get back to something that Dina was saying earlier, which is we need to educate those who are already in Missouri, right? Whether they are um, you know, US citizens by birth, whether they were an earlier wave of, of immigrant community communities, um, because I, I really, really do find profound, and, and, and I think it's very accurate, these studies that have shown that when people can be in dialogue with each other, mm -hmm. or if you can't have face-to-face -face dialogue, when we can, when people hear stories, real life stories about other people, our preconceived notions can soften and change. So I think there needs to be education on both sides. I don't think the burden can be just on, I, it's helpful, right? But not just telling immigrants, this is what we expect to be. You come in, you work, you need to be here. But at the same time, having a dialogue and an education the other way, right? And, and teaching people some cultural humility and, and how to ask questions and, and get to the root of what might be a misunderstanding. Um, I, think, I, I think that's important. So yeah, events and programming, I think that bring folks together. Um, in dialogue is, is critically important. And let me give Dina and Valerie each a chance. And then because of, I have a million more questions, but because of the time after that, I think I will stop and invite our audience to ask some questions. But let me give each of you a turn. Yeah, first. speaking about stories, I just, um, not to go into depth about how the news industry has been changing, but um, I would love to see more local newsrooms and journalism outlets and com smaller communities um, report more, have have the funding to report on stories on new, newcomers and even communities that have been there for many years. I mean, I live in Washington, D.C., so my local newspaper is the Washington Post, but 
Um, and I'm, I'm so thankful that my editors continue to um, uh, accept my pitches and to assign me stories related to um, refugees, but um, we don't, or I think smaller outlets are not so lucky. And um, I just, I would love to see more funding. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say the, the things that I think about um, relate to kind of destigmatization efforts, which kind of relate to this idea of dialogue um, especially in places where there isn't a big immigrant community, right? There's a lot of misunderstanding and people get their information from media, which isn't always correct as <laughs> Ariella has, has talked about in terms of the debate. Um, and I think these destigmatization de de stigmatization efforts can come in many different forms. One is through dialogue, um, through contact between immigrant and non-immigrant groups in very supported ways. And I think those things are hard to do, but I think they can be done with effort um, and you know, being thoughtful about what that process might look like. And in some of the research that I've done, frequent contact between immigrants and non-immigrants actually increases immigrant sense of welcoming and also trust. And this isn't like deep, these aren't deep ties. These are just day-to-day -day interactions with people. Um, and those day-to-day -day interactions tend to be, for the most part, positive. So it's it's a very simple thing. And there's a lot of research that shows that this is effective. Um, and some of the research that we're doing too, these contact effects tend to work more strongly for um, non-immigrants. But some of our research shows that for Mexican immigrants in particular, who are the most isolated and the least trustful, when they have contact with out groups, it leads to really huge effects. Um, so this idea of trying to destigmatize immigrants, either through face-to-face -face contact, right, with these dialogues, um, information campaigns, um, right, more kind of adopting a different kind of culture within the state or again, within local institutions about how you understand and kind of recognize the value of immigrant, immigrants and their social worth to the community. Um, I think those things are, are gonna be really, um, I would love to see in any place, right? Any city, any county, any area. Um, and then I'll just go back to, you know, I'm just ringing this bell about immigrant organizations um, and really giving funding if there were if we had dollars to those organizations because they can define what their needs are, um, exactly how they maybe wanna approach things. They can partner with other organizations. Uh, but those are the folks we need to be supporting, right? Building a leadership pipeline of immigrants who are leaders would also be great too, so. All right, I now welcome you. If you have questions, to please come up to one of the microphones. Yes. Good. Yes. yes. I'm a two and a second and a half generation American, American, um, and out of northern Mexico. And uh, most of the presentation has been from a local or personal uh, uh, perspective. I'm an economist and sort of a macroeconomist. I'd like to ask uh, what are some of the most notable contributions or benefits from having immig immigrants in the United States, immigrants uh, either documented or undocumented. And um, that is basically the question. Thank you. I, I do did bring some data. <laughs> um, I don't I don't have a full picture, but um, there's an organization called the American Immigration Council that every year runs data state by state, right? So um, yeah, I, I mean, I think this is crucial. And again, I, I I brought it, but when I don't love that this is how we measure integration, but I think this is very important to get the message to Americans, right, about what immigrants do contribute, right? You're not being asked to change something to welcome people just for their benefit, right? That there is a huge benefit. So um, 
in the state of Missouri, unfortunately, yeah, our, our population overall is declining, as is our share of immigrants. Our share immigrant population is at about 4.1% of the state population now. But this gets to something Hilberto was saying. The immigrant population in Missouri is much younger than the rest of the population. So 61% are between the ages of 16 and 64, which puts mm -hmm. them at working age. Um, and so therefore, um, immigrants being 4.1% of the population are 5.1% of workers, of workers. Of, of workers right now. Um, they, um, in the state of Missouri alone, paid $2.7 in taxes. Their spending power, right? So what is going to local businesses, $7.8 billion. Again, this is Missouri, right? From both documented and... Yes, this is all. They do break it down by undocumented later. Um, so far, we're talking about all of them. Um, the fo foreign-born is the term they're going to use. The foreign-born contribution to Social Security from Missouri mm. immigrants, $1 billion. Wait, though. Mm. <laughs> the foreign-born contribution to Medicare, $289.2 million, right? When we hear, it is true, when we hear if we deported all 11 estimated 11 million undocumented immigrants tomorrow we would tank social security and medicare yeah right i mean it just we it, it we would right we rely very heavily on that and again the workforce um the immigrant population in missouri um disproportionately has a higher percentage than u.s born population of people with less than a high school degree okay so the the U.S. born population with less than a high school degree is about 8% and the foreign born is about 18%. There are a lot of jobs that we need done that are done by laborers who don't have a high school degree, right? But then on the other end, they also have a disproportionately higher percentage of uh, graduate degrees. So 22% of the foreign born population in the state of Missouri has a graduate degree versus 12% of the U.S. born population. Um, they immigrants in Missouri start a lot of businesses. Yeah. So entre where did I see that? Entrepreneurs. That's on here too. Um, immigrant entrepreneurs is is a significantly high percentage. I will look for that. Oh, um, so again, they're four point one percent of the population, but five point six percent of our entrepreneurs in the region. Um, and you know that is a trickle down for lack of a better word, right? You create businesses, you're creating more jobs, bringing in more. So I, you know, I don't know if this is exactly what you're looking for. Um, percentage wise, most of the immigrants in Missouri are documented. Um, so I know we hear a lot about undocumented. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Again, I was trying to quickly highlight a few things. I can look for that. The share of the population of Missouri that is undocumented is 0.9%, less than 1%, yep. okay? So the percentage of the immigrant population is 22 of the immigrants, but of our total population, we we worry a lot about, some, some people in the state worry a lot about undocumented immigrants. We are talking less than 1% of the population mm -hmm. of, of Missouri. So I don't know if that's... <laughs> and right? if, if I can say, if I can add, you know, the undocumented that 0.9 percent of the population if they're working yeah. if somebody has them working they're contributing to the economy they're also paying taxes they're paying social security because some some um some businesses will collect yeah. but they will never get that money back and they cannot as undocumented migrants they cannot uh go and get any kind of public assistance exactly yeah. Thank you. I think those are some notable contributions. There are some notable uh, disadvantages of having some notable costs of having uh, immigrants, but um, uh, but that's for another question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, and thank you for for this presentation. My name is Nancy Spargo, and I'm here on behalf of Elliott Unitarian Chapel, uh, where I'm a leader in the immigration justice team. We support uh, asylum seekers predominantly, although other immigrants as well, um, as a part of our faith practice. And right now we're supporting a Honduran family, asylum seeking Honduran family. 
And I have to tell you that there's a part of me that wants to tell them they need to leave. Mm -hmm. It's a hostile environment. Dad was going to pay his phone bill down on Cherokee Street, was robbed at gunpoint. The upstairs neighbor who's drug involved because they don't have a lot of money for housing, <laughs> literally kicked in their door and we had to get police involvement and order protection, et cetera. Somebody randomly showed up this morning and tried to kick in the door again. Couldn't have been the same guy because he's still detained, involved multiple police squad cars, police chase, et cetera. They continue to be subjected to violence in spite of their efforts to flee the violence that they experienced in Honduras. And the chances of them having their asylum granted in Missouri are, Adrian, do you know the number? Yeah, less than 3%. Yeah. Less than 3%. Are they in court? Assuming they're in, which they're likely to be court. Yeah. Most yeah. Likely, yeah. yeah. In, in the and country. because they're from Honduras and if they were fleeing gang violence, it's in all practicality, less than 0.1%. Yeah, our judges don't grant asylum to Hungarians. So our last asylum seeker actually chose to go to Colorado because she was faced with wearing an ankle bracelet. This is a few years back. She was she was asylum seeker. She was legit, but she was going to have to wear an ankle bracelet. And she said, before I do that, I will leave. And she did. <laughs> she went to Colorado and she now has been granted asylum and is working on her citizenship. Right? So Somebody help me understand why, as somebody who cares very deeply about this family, why I would encourage them to stay in St. Louis. Why would I encourage them to stay in Missouri? Why wouldn't I tell them to jump the river mm -hmm. and go to Illinois, let alone Colorado, Seattle, <laughs> some other place, Springfield, Ohio, for God's sake. Why, why would they stay here? Somebody help me understand that, and thank you in advance. Yeah, that, that is a, um, first of all, um, you know, um, my heart breaks every time I hear, and, and you like this situation, we, we see that situation, we see more situations like that, or similar to situations like that, and not just in the city, but in the county everywhere. Um, it, it is an unfortunate situation. I will tell you that this office has been around for 10 months. So I will ask you and your organization to continue to work with partners. You know, if you are working with partners like Micah and, and all of them to see how safe today, how, how, they're, how can they be safe? How can they be protected? Um, you, I can give you my car. I can get you in contact with somebody at the police department that you can talk to and see what we can do um, to help them out. But give us a chance. I know this is not going to be a, a whatever situation. We, the city of St. Louis, has never invested in making sure that we become a welcoming city for immigrants until Mayor Jones took office. And this is three years ago. And I have been in the position for 10 months. So the journey is long. Uh, I know it's difficult. I can't say, oh, we, we can do an action plan and have police there because that's not, unfortunately, I can't say that. But I can tell you that we are looking to make, to, to make improvements so people, when they come here, they feel that they have a safer place that they can live. So hopefully that helped, but I will give you my car and we can be in contact. Nancy, I'll just say, I mean, I felt everything you said. I, I want to validate what you said. It's all true, right? I mean, it, it's hard, right? And I think mm -hmm. most for most of my clients, they don't have the means to go to another state, right? That's not an opportunity, right? But if they ask me, I'm going to have a really honest conversation about what the pros and cons would be of going somewhere else. And I'm mostly talking from a legal perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Because the chances of winning asylum here are just, you know, terrible. Um, but I mean, thank you for what you're doing, right? I, I'm sure you're running into 
barriers. All of us organizations are completely over capacity. We can't mm -hmm. take new clients, so they may not even yet have asylum representation, right? Thank you for what you're doing. It's, yeah, I feel everything you said and it's it's really valid and let's just try to keep being in dialogue and conversation and figuring out what we can do to make it better for those clients who, who don't have a choice, but to stick it out here until things change. Until, yeah, yeah, yeah. until we can make change. I think this will be our last question. Is that me? Yeah, please. Well, thank you, Darlene, for presenting this information. My concern is the, as a 400 year plus trafficked American, I wanted to know how are you bringing those other groups, like African Americans, closer to understanding what the struggle is for the more recent immigrants. A lot of times the other wants to hate on the other. Mm -hmm. And this constitutional amendment number seven that will be on the November ballot is very divisive. Mm -hmm. Starting off with preventing illegal aliens, whatever that is, from voting. Immigrants are trying to stay under the radar in most cases, the most law-abiding group of people in, in the area, but they're going to try to sneak and vote, really? But you'll get folks in the other group saying, yeah, they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be able to do that. But then you look in the body of that, and it's saying that the state of Missouri, our wonderful friends in Jefferson City, can override any laws and decisions that municipalities in the state make? How do we undo that? Mm -hmm. How do we communicate with communities, churches, or whatever it is? This is cool, but a lot of my people don't come on Washington's campus. I had a, three cars following me from Supac to Hillman last week. So how do we communicate, get that word out, or we will all be suppressed in terms of our voting rights? Mm -hmm come November. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, thank you for asking that. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really valid question, right? Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of fear mongering that happens, a lot of othering, right? And so there, there are many groups who deserve to be doing better in this state and who deserve more support, right? And, and what seems to be happening is that you have policymakers who are playing those groups against each other instead of saying, how do we try to help raise as many different groups and individuals up as we can? Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, the, uh, is it, I, I'm trying to remember, is it Constitutional Amendment 7, is it Proposition 7, whatever it's called, right? It, it's, it's completely fear-mongering, right? It is already unlawful for non-citizens to vote. And not only that, if non-citizens are unknowingly and erroneously registered to vote, which happens when they go apply for a driver's license, and the person at the DMV says, um, all right, you want to be registered to vote? And right, especially if their English is not, you know, at, at a fully proficient level, they're like, I don't know, I'm in front of a, an official, they say this, I say yes, right? They get registered to vote. They are permanently ineligible to naturalize and they can be ordered deported. It is, it is a deportation ground if they actually then vote. Immediately. Immigrant voting is so rare. So, so, so rare, right? So it's a red herring. It is just a way of fear mongering, but you're right. We need to do a better job of messaging to other communities who, you know, who face very real, you know, have very real needs that are also being ignored, particularly the African American community. And I've had conversations with people and I don't have the answers, but I appreciate the question. I think we do need to do better. And again, I think unlimited resources, you know, it'd be great if we had dial, if we could have dialogue and, and, and be in community. And so we can see we're in this together and it's not, you know, that cliche phrase, it, it's not, it's not pie, right? If we take and give some to this group, we're not taking from another group. We're trying to raise everybody up, but that's, that's hard to convey. You, that's not a little like, um, you know, it's easier to just pit people against each other quickly than it is to have those conversations. I, I, I would like to add that there is light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to, to communication and working within groups, right? Um, there are, for example, the Office of Violence Prevention uh, for the city of St. Louis. It is very intentional in, in not only producing information in different languages for people in, in, of communities of color, but also integrating what they're doing. If they go to Fairmount Park, um, they also go to Carandolet, and they go to Dutchtown, they go to different places where different people with different communities gather. They're starting 
to work with immigrant communities as well as part of their effort to um, disseminate information about crime prevention. So that, that is one, one thing that we're doing in the city of San Luis. Uh, another thing is like having, having conversations with different groups, with different religious groups in the space uh, and other organizations like, for example, We Power, which is very intentional in making sure that black and brown uh, entrepreneurs and people are lifted, right? So we are beginning that dialogue. It's not, a, it's not, it's at the early stage and I keep saying that and I'm sorry, I'm like a broken record, but it is because we have not invested. We have not invested in our black community. We have not invested in thinking towards the future and how we can accommodate growth and making people feel that they belong, right? In Brown uh, and other foreign born communities. So um, that is just a little, example, we will continue to push and work. Um, my job is a little bit difficult because I have to convince our government employees that they have to be accepting and they have to understand foreign born cultures. And at the same time, working with different organizations uh, in, the, in, the, in the community to make sure that everybody's at the same, at the same table and everybody has a has has an opportunity to be to make a decision to participate. Green round. Some of you might have seen it's green, but it was this Ukrainian green ground that was the border where the immigrants were being pushed back and forth until well, or February. So check it out. Okay. okay. Thank you. I think I'll, I don't want to cut off this conversation, but I promise time to mingle and there's food and I don't want to be keeping people from the food. So let me stop here and thank our panelists so much for this really rich discussion and thank all of you.